Welcome to This Commerce Life. We are an unscripted podcast dedicated to small businesses and entrepreneurs in the retail and consumer packaged goods space in Canada and the United States. I am Phil Chang, co-host and co-founder. And I'm Kenny Benucci, co-host and co-founder of This Commerce Life. Our love is the journey to retail and our passion is sharing that with you every week. Hi, Michael. Not working. Um, I don't know. I can't. He's trying to come in. Yeah, he's trying. Give it a second. Give it a second. Give it a second. I'm always happy to see it's not just my computer that does whatever his computer is doing. Hey, how are you? How you doing? No, we can't hear you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Don't take your time. It makes me feel a lot better. You just do you. I'm, I'm, I'm totally Kenny, good. Kenny goes through this every time. Michael. Every single time. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Poor guy. Well, it's nothing worse when you're kind of on behind and then panicked. Yeah. It's Try Hello? again. Oh, there Hello. we go. How are you? Google does not play well with Safari. So uh, and it, yeah. and that's, that's the default. So now it works. That's yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. It's okay because usually yeah. it's me. Yeah. So when other people struggle through it, it makes me just feel just that much better that I know it's, some, it's just not yeah. always me. Yeah. I actually don't love Google Meet, I have to tell you. it's I find it's the glitchiest of, uh, of them. Um, yeah. We we hear that too. I I think the problem like because we we do uh, this commerce life is powered by Google. I, uh, that sounds like a sponsor, even as I was saying it, but it's not sponsored. And God knows Google is never giving be us money to do anything. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah. but we do use it for all of our stuff. And so for a long time we use Zoom. Yeah. For everything, yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, and we love it. But then we kind of went. Well, there's some economics here, right? Is like we could do this, or we could just we could just use what's built into the Google platform, so we don't have to pay extra, right? So totally, totally. So we've done that, but there are definitely drawbacks. Like it seems to be the one that's hardest for people to jump into, and then there's weird, like Google somehow doesn't like us congregating as a grid, right? Like everybody's like a single face, which I don't love. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. You know, like, yeah, it is very odd, but yeah, that's a... yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, okay. yeah, it could be yeah. worse. Yeah, no, no. Like, look, you know, three, four years ago, everyone was like, hello, yeah. hello, <laughs> is anyone, can I, you know, like, what's happening? You know, like, so at least now we're all. Look at the microphone. No? It's the microphone looking thing. Just hit the microphone thing. <laughs> no, I can't see you. It's the click the camera thing now. Yeah, so. yeah, no doubt. <clears throat> oh my. Um, it is nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to nice to uh, find yeah. a connection. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's, it's, been, it it's been an evolution. So yeah. that's that's uh you know, but but well, it's life, good. life sort of gets in the way sometimes too, right? Yeah, yeah. Life is life is moving like a mile a minute. Like I was I was thinking about it and um like you know, I think we started talking to you in like May or June, right? But then it was like yeah, you yeah. were there, and then we weren't, and then we were there, and then you weren't, and then there was like this summer, and you know, yeah. trying to take some vacation, and then travel, and then next thing you know, we're like, oh my god, it's just I know. I'm I'm like, where, are where are you guys located? I'm in Vancouver. Are, he's You're in Vancouver. Vancouver. I'm in Toronto. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so between you? us, we've we've I'm got literally like, in between. <laughs> half are you in Winnipeg or are you in Brandon or are you like, in Winnipeg? Winnipeg. Got, 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 got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we uh, so so we love this. We'll we'll I'll do an intro and then we'll just we'll just jump into it. Um, we have Michael Mikulak. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, so we've got Michael Mikulak on, and he is the executive director of Food and Beverage Manitoba. And so we're super excited to talk to you. We um, we kind of really love 
Um, we have loved working with food and bev organizations. We uh, we spent a good chunk of time this year with the BC food and bev guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've been talking to our friends in Alberta as well. We've done a bit of talking to um, Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, and then between, between all of you food and beverage and food processor folks, um, we also have some really deep ties with, uh, with CHFA, for example. Um, and along the way, we picked up a bunch of acronyms like CFIB and NPC and CFIN. And but I, I think what it nets out to is we are excited to be able to connect small business to as many, yeah. you know, of you folks. We, we just see so much value in what's happening. So we're excited to talk to you, um, excited to pick your brain and, and kind of see what's going on in your world. You guys do your job right. You make it so much easier. Yeah for yeah. people to try to figure out yeah. this game mm -hmm. which on a good day is overly complicated yes and it doesn't need to be but it's too late we've overcomplicated this game so it's really nice to have these organizations mm -hmm. that offer resources mm -hmm. and so what we've been trying what we've been doing with especially with mostly more with bc food and bevan with C, uh canadian health is where we we've become a, a mini resource for them as well and for their mm -hmm um membership so mm -hmm. I, I, we're really excited to have you on i think yeah it's, really cool. it's, mean, a, it's kind of cool too i was i was looking at your linkedin and and i realized that you you're kind of a on you're an ontario kid right you've got mcmaster in your background and then like so i grew up in oakville so halton yeah. is is yep. uh is really is is kind of like my home home yeah. turf, if you will right like i i spend all my time in mississauga now um you know but but halton's where i grew up so kind of cool to see yeah yeah, um, yeah i did my i did my master's and my phd in, at mcmaster i mean i grew up in Winnipeg, but i moved out there and spent the last 17 years in southern ontario so wow. okay. it wasn't until the pandemic that i ended up coming back here uh and sort of in the middle of the pandemic but yeah no i know that area very well worked in halton region for a little while worked at the united way there for a while yeah. as well so very yeah. very rooted in that community as well very cool very cool. I okay. Have no so, idea where you guys are talking, and then that's all good. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's you know, I so Kenny, Oakville. so Kenny, um, we drive. You know, when we drive to, so we we had um we had a uh, a husband wife combo on Mimi and Glenson, and they live um they live and they run a restaurant in Oakville, and mm -hmm. um, it's off Ford Drive. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so that area, and so that's about as far as Kenny goes before he starts complaining about driving. Yeah, um, from, from my house because I I live closer to the airport, so yeah. by the time we get out there, I gotta feed him. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> you know so it's too long. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so so um, so Michael kind of spent like Oakville is where Halton Halton is the region that kind of looks after Oakville, Burlington, yeah, parts yeah. of Hamilton, and you know, kind of. Um, anyway, I'm gonna shut up now. Next 40, 45 minutes ish. Yeah, yeah, about that. Um, is yours. We would love to hear about, um, you've started some of this stuff. Um, you've got some teaching in your background. You've got a whole bunch of things in Halton and then Winnipeg. So we kind of want to hear your journey and then and what you're doing with Food and Bev now, which is pretty cool mm -hmm. too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, I've taken a very weird path, I would say, in terms of my career. Um, I, I, I sort of consider, you know, I think something that's always been kind of central to it has been food. Um, so, and that for me started um, actually from an environmental kind of perspective. So when I started doing my master's and my PhD at McMaster, I was interested in kind of um, sustainability. Uh, and I, I wanted to understand how people think about this kind of, you know, back then in particular, this kind of elusive thing that people were talking about called the green economy, right? And, uh, and I think for, you know, the more people that I talk to about this, uh, the more I kind of got a clear sense that it was confusing, people didn't understand it. And so I got really interested actually in food through um, back in probably about 2005, 2006, um, when the 100 mile diet became really popular. Right. Um, so uh, the whole locavore movement, right? And so I was sort of in a fortunate position. I was in doing my PhD. I was looking at kind of everything from policy to like popular narrative. So I was really interested in like kind of um, 
writers like Michael Pollan, uh, figures like Jamie Oliver, these kind of folks that were looking at food systems transformation from that popular kind of popular culture lens, yeah. right? And um, at the same time, that 100 mile diet was becoming this like thing that people were talking about. And so I said, you know what, I'm gonna do it. So for about a year, I did it. Uh, I started going and, and I was very strict about it. I, I said, I'm gonna get everything from 100 miles around, ha around Hamilton. And uh, and uh, it was wow. Wow. I, I, it was an eye opening experience. This was, I'm sure it was. Yeah, this was in 2000. I think I did this in 2007. So this was before a lot of the infrastructure was there, uh, and it was very eye opening. I was sort of like I had I didn't really know a lot about it. I had no farming background or anything like that. I love I liked gardening and things like that. But I was like, you know, I'm gonna have to figure this out. So I started actually interning on an organic farm. I started meeting with local producers. I started learning how to can, how to bake my own bread, how to make my own cheese. Like I really started to sort of getting wow. into that whole kind of lifestyle during that year and trying to incorporate it into my thesis work at that point, which was kind of bringing together policy, kind of community economic development, popular narrative, and using the 100 mile diet as a way into that whole thing. Um, I had a bit of a aha moment at one point. I remember I was looking at that point, I was vegetarian and I was looking for beans. And I was like, I know there's beans because I drive by all these bean fields that are being grown in Ontario. So I'm like, certainly I must be able to get beans to be able to eat, uh, to eat through the winter. So I start calling around, find a distributor, ask them, hey, can I buy some beans from you? And they're like, sure, how many tons would you like? Like, I, I don't want tons. I want a, I want a couple bags of beans. They're like, oh, we don't sell beans locally. I'm like, well, why? I'm like, well, well, Ontarians don't want to pay the prices that Europeans will. So we actually import all of our local beans for sale from China and we export all of the beans we grow to Europe. Oh, my God. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like, that yeah, is there's nothing right on that. No. And I was just like, <laughs> And the what fact is, that you can actually economically make it make sense is yeah. even worse. Yes. And I think for me, that was that moment where I was okay. Like, what, how does this relate to this idea of a green economy? And how does this relate to like things like community gardens, which were becoming super, yeah. super popular at that point. So I started, um, so all of those pieces were kind of coming together uh, through my dissertation, through my work. Eventually this turned into a book called The Politics of the Pantry that kind of brought all these uh, pieces together. And, and I started to really um, try to understand how do we use this interest in local food as a way to access some of these harder policy discussions, right? How to talk about things like, why is our food system organized this way? How do we fix it? And how do we avoid some of the kind of simplistic traps, I think? Because I was initially also sort of like, well, local is always better. Uh, it's not like it's th there's a lot of cases where actually the environmental footprint of shipping things in is actually quite a bit better than say everybody for example driving to their local farm right. and picking up their food so right at one point i actually did start a small organic farm uh fed about 60 uh, 60 folks off of like a quarter acre so a really sort of highly productive um sort of environmentally focused farm and it was, uh, you know, one of the things that I really realized early on in that journey was, hey, if everybody drives to pick up their food at my farm, I basically negated the whole carbon right. saving that, that happened there. So we did something, we defaulted and did bicycle based delivery for everybody uh, and just sort of worked things into that. So like little things like that, where I want, I was, I became really interested in that ended up sort of taking me in various uh, directions. I taught uh, university courses around food systems. I spent probably a decade teaching in different universities around that. Um, I worked, I, like I said, I started a farm that was sort of focused in on this and eventually got into kind of the funding side of food insecurity. So I started working, that's where I started working with Halton Region and the United Way on sort of looking at that kind of granting for programs that sort of fund and connect things like urban agriculture initiatives with mm -hmm. mental health, creating mm -hmm. social enterprises that can support these kinds of things. And so uh, eventually it ended up uh, ended up with my current role here. Like I said, during the pandemic, I decided that I wanted to kind of come home and back to uh, back to Manitoba, be closer to my family, uh, bring uh, let the let the kids, you know, know their grandparents a little bit more. 
And that's when I started working with the food processors, the transformers. I hadn't actually at that point really worked with the processors. And so uh, really interesting, lots of, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of learnings there as well. Well, because you've done a, a, you're all over the place. I mean, all interconnected and interrelated, but yeah. and very different. Like, you know, it's very different being on a farm than being in a processing plant. Yes. Uh, versus being on the other side of in academia. Like, I mean, you're really all over the place. Yeah. Any, um, any yeah. surprising moments? Like, like it, I don't think it means anything because I think, I think yeah. you're, you're doing some amazing things. But that first moment on a farm or kind of being able to do that, were there any kind of like surprising aha moments for you? Oh, so many all the time. And I think, I think part of it, it, part of the reason that I like sort of putting on different hats is, is for that is, is specific. Like I'm, I am the quintessential kind of lifelong learner. I'm sort yeah. of addicted to kind of like yeah. new novelty essentially yeah. and sort of figuring out. And I think where I've really been able to, and I think this is sort of generally, this is kind of my humanity soapbox um, is that I think we often forget the role of the humanities in playing that knowledge translation role, right? Um, a lot of our systems are siloed. And so we work in like very distinct buckets. Like I am in government and I do this policy work on health and education. I do this policy work on food and agriculture. I do this on environment and climate change. And I think that works to a certain extent, but I think we start to lose interconnections. Uh, so one example, so Phil, you're in the Southern Ontario. When I first moved there, uh, 2004, I was shocked by the smog days, right? Uh, the, the, just the black, the black and the brown smoked everywhere. I was like, how do people live through this? This is insane. And when they got rid of the coal plants and the smog days disappeared, that was pushed forward as a green energy initiative, a climate change initiative. When the reality, and of course it was, it was one of the biggest sort of uh, biggest uh, impacts on kind of climate change that Canada had ever done to that point. But I would say one of the more important impacts of this was childhood asthma. Yeah. Dramatically reduced. Yeah. We were at a 30% childhood asthma rate and that's been falling ever since, yeah. right? Yeah. That's not accounted for. And I think that was my original interest in the green economy was like, our economic model isn't adequately making these connections, right? Isn't connecting the kind of costs in one area with the benefits in others. And so it becomes an incentive problem. It becomes an incentive alignment problem, right? For sure. And so, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, that's, is that's this super relevant? I mean, you look at the conversation we're having with retailers now, yes. increasing costs, right? And you've got, I think even the industry that, you know, we're in an industry that quite honestly, as brands and retailers, we, we pay attention to ourselves, right? We don't really worry about what's going on, but right. even the conversation over here about like, guys, like these costs keep going up. And then we've got this government, all these kind of governments group. Well, let's throw some money at this. Let's, let's uh, put a cap on this. Let's put a tax on this. And you kind of go, no, no, like, we're over here and over here, but all of the stuff in between That's that right. make this do this, we're not, you know, so I, I think what you're doing, like, we're trying to put, impose a policy yeah. from a government level and you're looking, but you guys have no clue what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, and you don't get the point. Kind of and then you're looking at the other side thinking, you guys, we're, we're killing each other here. Mm -hmm. Like, this, mm -hmm. we're not, and I think the silo thing is the game, but because I think that's sort of how. It's sort of how it works. I mean, if you look at the, you know, the true capitalistic play is, is that you, 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 it's, if you do, you worry about your own little world and if you can benefit others around you, that's, that's fantastic, but that's not what it's really designed for. And then the other side is, is for the collective, but then you lose the incentive of, of doing right. that's the right. cool things, right? Because it won't happen because why do it when there's really no incentive to do it? That's right. That's it's right. Kind of, like, I agree with you. It's, it's funny though when, when you when you talk it, and then you think, well, shit, no kidding, we're in so much trouble because it's hard to get all these. So we interrupt together. you. What what is the solution? Give us the. <laughs> well, listen, you got listen. You got about thirty minutes. Tell us what to do. We hear we hear yeah. the promised land. We're we're following yeah, exactly. <laughs> Michael, help us all. Save us. Yeah. 
Well, I, I do think, I mean, I do think it is about breaking down those silos. And I think because, I mean, you, you talked about incentives, Kenny, right? Yeah. And I think this is this is really crucial. And I think it's it, it's going to take some creative thinking around this, right? I think we get stuck. So like right now, for example, we're stuck in this like debate about the carbon tax, right? And I get really, really frustrated by this because I think part of it is kind of a poor marketing on the part of why why the why the people who designed it decided to call it a tax i have no idea well you killed it before you started yeah and it's just and it's just because in reality and i think this is this is the thing that i think a lot of you know kind of more of the of, of the business folks don't get is that is we have two options to deal with climate change roughly one is kind of a top-down command and control kind of like let's regulate this and really kind of control this in that kind of top-down way or you can go and say let's create incentives that internalize the costs right. of this and allow the business community to figure it out based on whatever is more efficient I, the reality is you need both of them you need both you need both of them but right now for whatever reason like to me the carbon tax is the pure capitalist way to solve this problem right it is the least um obtrusive it's the least controlling it doesn't tell you how to do it it basically just says you cannot treat the atmosphere as a free dump right like th that's it it's as simple as that why they decided to call it a carbon tax instead of something else uh, an alignment uh an incentive whatever like i mean I think there's a hundred other names that we could have come up with and now it's become politicized and it's become this thing that that politicians are using to bludgeon each other and say we are against this because it's somehow about affordability it's like no we have to realize what is the purpose of our economy right and how do we do how do we it's not either or right like we need we need business to be able to drive innovation to be able to drive value creation to create things that we need and want uh to create wealth but we also need to do that within the constraints of and realize that a business that is designed only to create profit for its shareholders misses out on the broader stakeholders. Absolutely. And, and I think it's become so either or. And, and I think, again, this is where sort of you can see it in my career path. I like to break down silos and move between things. I feel more comfortable in the in between than I do in in a specific area. And I think we need we need to cultivate that more. We need to cultivate that more in our education system. We need to cultivate that more in our in 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 uh, in in our policymakers, in our business leaders. We have to feel we have to we have to break down that kind of tribalism that i think has happened in here and it's it's really unfortunate because i think it prevents us from seeking the solutions that are needed i totally i think we probably both totally agree with you but the yep. system is sort of set up that way yes that's two right. parties three parties that's three, right two silos three silos yep I got a business so side like, versus this side it, it's and it's thinking, one, listen, uh, yeah. capitalism works within Mm -hmm. a socialistic world and vice That's versa you can't right. you can't run independent of each other because no. we've shown worldwide neither works on their own no. they just don't they don't you they can't, don't you can't I focus also, on but, an individual and a community but it, kenny it, I, I also think that we are like so, so Kenny and I live in this in between world, right? Which like we do, because that's we what do we need a to lot be. of in between. We do a, a lot of connecting. We do a lot of, and um, probably the parts that get the. I imagine that you probably get the same looks. Actually, um, I, I'm actually like smiling a lot here because I I just think I feel like we're kindred in this sense. Mm. Is we do a lot of connecting the dots. We do a lot of like telephone operator sort of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. there are a lot of moments that people look at us and go. We don't understand. So yep. do you do this for money? Do you do this? And sometimes we go, yeah, we get paid for some of this stuff. But a lot of this stuff, we just think you need to talk to them. That's so right thing to do. go, you know, I don't need to be here. Off you go. Or I'm happy to be in the middle of it. Like, I just, I just think like we just think that you should be here. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go and do that. And we, we get a lot of confused looks, actually, a lot of times. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, well, but we hear society, you. we've played sides now, and it's unfortunate yes. because it, there is no left and right. There is no red and blue. We'll play with American colors. There mm -hmm. is none of that. It's all, yeah. everybody is in the same pot, yeah. in the same middle. We're all in the same space. Yeah. You can't yeah. run 
one without the other. And, you know, because you pollute doesn't mean I don't get the, the negativity of it. And if hmm. I don't pollute, doesn't mean you don't get the positivity of it or whichever side. And again, I don't want to do positive negative because that's the same problem. Yep. Yep. Most things in life really and truly aren't that clear. Yep. Most and of the world lives in the middle. That's yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think sadly we're losing a little bit of that sense of collectivity, right. Of just that sort oh, of, like, how do we, how do we um, bridge that gap? How do we, you know, I might not agree with your politics. I might not agree with your Why? positions. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We, we need to find some way to kind of, right. you know, to, to have productive discussions that recognize that we might not agree, but we do have to live together on this finite planet that's experiencing multiple crises at once, right? right. And, and if we can't deal with the kind of equity problems that we're dealing with, if we can't deal with, with um, you know, in Canada, truth and reconciliation um, with our Indigenous um, uh, um, uh, brethren, if we can't deal with sustainability in a way that doesn't alienate and at the same time doesn't recognize that, yes, people's jobs are going to be disrupted and we have a responsibility to make sure that there's some kind of safety net to connect or to catch them and retrain them into different ways make them part of it right like i think these are all really important kind of um big wicked problems that cannot be solved with ideologically quote unquote pure kind of positions we it need work. To, we need to be comfortable in the messy middle it won't work the other way you're right i mean you yeah. think about it, all through time yeah. things have changed you know one time the mechanic was the guy who was who took care of the horses and put horseshoes on. Yep. Horses yep. have now become really a, a nonsensical animal on the planet. They don't serve yep. a purpose anymore. Love yep. horses. No yep. problem with horses. No horse haters. Love yep. horses. <laughs> but let's be serious. They don't pull any carts anymore. We don't use them to get around. Did I, did I just hear you I say that you hate horses? Is that <laughs> why? You know that? See, this is where Phil... Danny. You know Chang? Oh, my God. It's still early. <laughs> But How do you know you, know you might totally people. be offending Michael here? Like, I don't, oh my gosh. People are going to horse riding yeah. tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> I'll just tell her that I spoke to someone who really yeah. hates horses. Just hate horses. <laughs> yeah. Love horses. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, it's always a classic example. I mean, that's what all people did. Yeah. They moved an entire world into a different spot. We still function. Yeah. But you yeah. don't have to dig in. So I think that's the problem. We've gotten this feeling as a society in general that you need to dig in. Yes. You don't yes. need to dig in. Yeah, you should have you should have an ideological idea of where you think the world should be. I have no issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's probably somewhere in the middle. And the extremes don't fix it. It's yes. there's 90% of us park in the middle. Yes. The 10% are fringe. They don't they're not yeah, going to get it done. Been driving it. politics, that, that fringe, um, you know, I think we've we've all been radicalized essentially in that way to believe that that fringe is is sort of uh, key to our identity, key mm -hmm. to our kind of affiliation, mm -hmm. key to our to to all of these different things, and it's so unfortunate that it, it is, is terrible. And yeah. Maybe maybe and you know maybe we maybe because there's been so much change on mm -hmm. the planet in the last forty or fifty years, maybe this is how it has to go. Because yeah. it's, a, it's maybe we're not that bright, really, at the end of the day, and we just need more time to figure yeah. things out. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it is. Like, I, I don't yeah. understand why we we just become. Well, I think it's it's sort of you know personally, like you know, you know, if I was if if I was to sort of guess, I mean, I think a lot of this, you know, I think we are still stuck in a scarcity mentality in a world that has the potential to enter like post scarcity, right? Like, I think there's a lot of technology and innovation, you know, I think we're at this awkward cusp, where there's a lot of things that, you know, I think we overproduce that we have a ton of, but are still being treated as scarce goods, right? Uh, I think education is a great example of this, right? Um, why we treat that as a scarcity as something that you have to buy into, as opposed to kind of, you know, something that is just a common good that actually raises it's just a given. like it's just should be a given. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's a lot of things like that, that we're still stuck in that kind of old, I think we, our minds haven't caught up with the technology. And the reality is that too often, you know, we, we, we let that technology kind of develop at a rate where our policy and our culture and our don't, aren't, aren't ready to catch yeah. up with it. And I think that is where like smart regulation is important. 
right? Um, I think we're, we're going to deal with that with AI. Um, it frustrates me how much of the discussion about AI right now is about the existential terminator risk. Right. It's like, come on, guys. Like, AI is not conscious. It's probably never going to get conscious. It, it's going to change the world, but it's going to change the world in the way that going from horse to car was, right? It's going to change the fundamental technological and kind of infrastructure of how we do things. It's going to displace jobs. It's going to create tools that will improve jobs. That's not the same. And I think we're being distracted by these kinds of things. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. But, that, but that's our typical world. Yeah. Red herring yeah. everywhere. Everywhere. It's everywhere. just as soon as someone says, hey, we should do this. Every, you know, it's and it's 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 a side thing again. Yeah. Again, if you talk to the folks parked in that sweet spot in the middle. Most mm -hmm. people are scared of it. Yes. And there's some reasons you should be. Yes, yeah, yeah. But for the most part, it's probably going to make things a little easier. Mm -hmm. But just try to figure it, it's it's there. Right. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. Maybe again, maybe we just need it's the reset. Right. Yeah. And I think part of it is like, I mean, I think it comes down to trust, right? I mean, if you look at, so, you know, if you look oh, at something like the rise of, so trust in public institutions has gone down for the last 20 years, like significantly. What? Right? No, 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 no. Big no. time in the last five to 10 years, like huge, <laughs> yeah. right? Huge. Just, yeah. 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 And, and I think a lot of it is because, you know, we've seen our politicians and we've seen Kind of, and 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 I don't want to accuse the politicians because I think a lot of this has actually been spurred by the by a, another impulse, which is like let's deregulate everything, right? Let's deregulate and like leave it all to the market, right? And I think what that's created is this: we've really eroded any kind of sense of security that those displaced by that technological change used to have, right? It used to be that as industry got more productive, right? After World War II, everybody did get wealthier, right? People did have, there was that opportunity that you could support a family. Right. That is not the case anymore. Not anymore. We've totally disconnected productivity gains from the average person. And as a result, I think a lot of people, that insecurity, again, you look at like, I always wondered why are there so many Trump supporters in that rust belt right like it doesn't make sense a billionaire <laughs> demagogue that's a person going to who be basically would have unregulated everything which means yeah. you would have definitively lost your jobs absolutely definitively absolutely. definitively but you know why because the other side did shit for me yes that's right well at the yeah. end of the day you failed me you're the ones that said you were going to protect me yeah this jackass it doesn't yeah. pick pick jackass insert name here i don't care which side oh, yeah. That's right. Does it matter? Left, yeah. right, and middle. That yeah. person is saying the opposite. Yeah. This is what's happening. You guys screwed this up. Where do you want me to go? Yep. Yeah. And it and it comes down to that feeling of insecurity, 100%. right? Seeing this with the oil patch discussions right now, yeah. right? Where people are there are like, well, all of these people who are working in Alberta, who if we decarbonize our economy, where are they going to go? And instead, we really do need to be talking about, well, they are going to be part of the green economy. Like, we need them to put up windmills, put up solar panels. Whatever. We figure to build dams. If that, if, and if you don't want to build dams, build more. I don't care what you do. Yeah. Do something. But I think it's that if we need to make sure that government and that, uh, and that our systems are in place that can that people see a path forward, right? Because what do we all need, right? We want that feeling of security. We want to know that we can support ourselves. We want to know that we can support our communities and families and have meaning in it. And I think this is this is going to be the challenge, especially with AI, right? There's so much potential. Like personally, I think all of us should work less, right? Like, I mean, everybody should work less. If we can create a system where people are working less and doing more that is valuable like things like providing like for a, a good example is right now our population is aging right we don't pay people to take care of their families in any way well why not like if we are talking about automating all of these jobs why are we not allowing people to age in home and paying the people who can take care of them to be able to do that like how many people would work a split shift of something part time to be able to do that, and yeah. like there's, there's creative, I think, policy solutions that that both government and business need to look towards. That when you do automate something, like why not think about these kind of broader picture pieces and how we can be part of these solutions? But I think not enough people are thinking about them.
Well, because I don't think a lot of happens too. What happens is I think the three of us will talk and the mm. three of us probably park well into the middle, whether it's a little left or right, really doesn't really matter. You're parking in the middle somewhere. Yep. The end of the day though, we're not the ones in government. Yep. Like, yep. so what we do is who we put into government is an extreme on either side. Yes. Yes. And that's what you get. So how do you get policy that talks to the middle? If you think about it, why would you put people into, into homes to, for example, when they get, when they age, the, the cost to build it, the cost of that, this house is already paid for. That's right. There is no cost to society at no. this moment for me to go to the end here. Yeah. You know why? You don't owe I don't owe anybody anything and they don't owe me anything. Yeah. Yep. It's cheaper for someone to come here than me to go build something like this that's for 10,000 people Yeah. and have 10,000 people in it. I'm, I'm already here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one, Kenny. I, you know what, I, think, I think there are other benefits, right? There's like tons being, of things, but my point is having a community discussion. It does. You don't have to yeah. do it though. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't care, but it's, it's yeah. worth a talk sometimes. Agreed. I think what Agreed. we don't do is we just, what we do is we discount it. Cause what we'll say, well, that's a socialist. Yeah. We're not talking about, it. Oh, that's a capitalist. We're not going to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that it's, it's a discussion. Yeah. When we're in the middle, it works. Mm-hmm. It's maybe not this home feel. You're right. I, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. Like, I, the, you know, um, I do want to bring us back a little bit. Yep. Um, I want to make sure because I uh, we could do this all day. I want to talk about the business I, where yeah. your world but, is but, at. But we do want to talk a little bit about about managed hope of food and bev as well. Yeah. So, like, you have taken this really cool path to like being able to stitch some of these things together. What are you What are you seeing like on the you know, now that you're with the food and bath guys, you know, you're working with brands, retailers, um, what's, what's going on in your world? Like, how does this next learning journey for you, all of those sort of things? I'm super curious now, right? Because, yeah. I, you know, yeah, I mean, it's been a big, it's been eye opening yeah. in terms of a lot of things. So one of the things that I think was that sort of hit me right away was that I, I had an assumption going into this, that we were going to be working with all of these kind of like, you know, when it comes to processing, I assumed that it's going to be the the general mills the maple leafs like the big players i was shocked to learn how much of the food like almost all of my members have less than 10 employees exactly it's mom and pop shops most of this country runs with less than 10 employees it's crazy it was really eye-opening for me and i think that really sort of drove a lot of the strategy for how we were going to support this sector in the industry right so and and a good example is 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 around sustainability. So one of the things when I came into this role, I was like, well, what are you doing around sustainability? Like the food the food food system right now is responsible for thirty three percent of global emissions. It's responsible for eighty percent of all water use globally, and it's responsible for about seventy percent of all land use. Governments have sort of I don't want to say ignored it, but this was the first meeting of the of COP. <laughs> that mentioned food system transformation as central to climate change mitigation and adaptation. The first one, of, what is it, COP27. Wow. That is shocking. Like, and it is just shocking to have literally the single biggest industry impacting and impacted by climate change. And I think this is crucial. We are all suffering because of the rise of prices that are happening at the grocery stores. Right. It's only going to get worse. Like yeah. think about how much it was impacted by the war in Ukraine and how it rippled through commodity markets and what it's doing. Imagine when whole regions crops collapse because of, 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 of massive droughts of heat waves yeah. of heat domes, atmospheric rivers. We are entering an era of disruption. Yeah. It is only going to get worse if we can't deal with this. So, what does that mean for food insecurity for 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 all all of these big all of these things and so when i got into this role i was like why are we talking about this like why aren't we getting around why aren't we advocating more to government to provide supports that are targeted and especially why aren't we doing this for the small producers that are Mm -hmm. the backbone Mm -hmm. of this system who cannot do this on their own and who if we don't support will disappear right and so a lot of our efforts have been around that have been really around how do we 
move the sector into this. So wanting, and, and it's, it, you know, we've been doing it in different ways with curriculum, with training, with partnerships. But one of the key ways we've been doing that I'd like to put in a plug for is, is a conference that we've been putting on. This is the second year we're putting it on called Cultivate. And so Cultivate, um, you can find all this information on our website. Um, the first one we did um, was last year in September. And the goal was really to kind of actually scare the industry a little bit to sort of say, hey, this is coming. How are you prepared for this? Like, we already see the EU putting in really strict regulations around this. We have a plastic, a single use plastic ban that at that point was still just on the horizon. We have all of this consumer kind of push towards this. And the reality is, again, like from that standpoint of climate change mitigation, even if you ignore it, it's going to come down to affect your bottom line because of the commodity price disruptions, right? These kind of systems are not immune. They're actually extremely vulnerable to these changes, right? Perfect. Yeah. And so a lot of it was sort of like, let's, let's paint the picture. Let's get people sort of looking at this and let's, let's try to start threading a narrative saying, what are the opportunities here in especially Western Canada to lean into becoming kind of one of the more sustainable kind of food producers in the world. Right. Cause I think we have all the right pieces mm -hmm. uh, this year. Our focus is in on net zero. All of the big brands are making net zero commitments, right? A lot of industries are making these really sort of broad pronouncements about get to net zero by 2050. We're seeing it in Sobeys. We're seeing companies like Maple Leaf. And so we br we're bringing all of those folks together in this conference to say, here's kind of what we're doing, how we've approached this, how we've shifted our strategy. And here are the, the people that can help you make this a reality. So it's that big picture kind of like aspirational, broken down into tactics, into those strategies that can, and, and into the practitioners that can really support you and say, yeah, here's this technology that we have that's going to help you look into your supply chain and calculate your footprint and make actionable insights around, hey, if I wanna, if I wanna reduce my, my into this and then report out on my ESG targets, because this is again, something people don't realize, the banking regs have changed in Canada. There's mandatory ESG requirements that are coming out over the next couple of years. If you do not have your, a picture of what your greenhouse gas emissions are, you are not gonna have access to capital in the next right. couple of years. Um, you are not going to be able to export to many jurisdictions in the world. Um, these are fundamental risk yeah, management deal. that you need to be making as a, as a business. And how does a business with five employees where maybe everybody wears every hat, how do they, how do they adjust to this? How do they, how do they adapt to this? Well, they, you know, like, I mean, yeah, we work with similar people and sometimes, you know, sustainability is, yeah, I'm sustaining myself, right? I'm sustaining yeah. my five employees. Like, the paper the end of the day. like, you know, ESG is what, right? And you're like, yeah. uh, environmental, social governance. And they're like, yeah, you got it. Who does that? What's sustaining the ourselves. That? You know, you got it. <laughs> like, we're in business, you know, like, so it's kind of amazing. Um, for listeners, um, the link to cultivate will be in the podcast notes as well it happens in february february 6th victoria in in winnipeg i just want to make sure yeah. the plug is complete um we think these things are amazing i'm kind of getting goosebumps about looking at this kenny and i will talk to you about us coming out to this i think yeah. is something yeah. we should think about so but um we love this so wow kind of crazy you got some crazy stuff going on here yeah, yeah. And so we're working on a lot of different things into there. So again, from that perspective of like helping on the on the small, small scale, yeah. you know, we're working on like pilot projects around how to provide access to that data to those small processors. So we're working with a company called Theory Mesh. They're going to be presenting at the conference. They've got a really interest. They're trying to leverage kind of a lot of the farm data that's yeah. sort of available, you know, <clears throat> that John Deere tractor is pulling things all the time. There's satellites that are out there. They're trying to leverage AI to be able to sort of say, okay, well, here's kind of how, here's how we can estimate carbon sequestration in this kind of soil that has no till applied to it and these kinds of things and really give you those kind of granular insights that until now have been only accessible to companies who could put out 
a, a, a couple hundred thousand dollars on a life cycle analysis, uh, and which is just a snapshot. It's just a snapshot. Yeah. Um, and so I think we're in an exciting period. I, I liken it to what happened 30 years ago with food safety when a whole industry was born around ASAP certification, around training staff, around uh, supply chain management, about all of these things that happened about you know 30 years ago or so around that, that mm -hmm. fundamentally transformed the industry and actually led to Canada becoming one of the most sort of sought after companies in the world around food safety, right? And around that kind of ability to provide high quality and some of the safest food in the world, I think we're going to see a similar thing emerge with sustainability. And I think the key is to make sure that we're avoiding the path of greenwashing uh, and that we're doing it in a way that is truly authentic and it is transparent, that ESG, right? Environments, uh, uh, the social and the governance. Yeah. We forget the importance of that governance. It's not sexy to talk about governance and about well, likes to talk about regulation and someone watching and managing it. But at the yeah. end of the day, yeah, if you're, if you're allowed to run a muck, you will run a muck. Yeah. Well, and clarity. I think it's really important for like, people, like, like regulation is kind of this dirty word often. And I'm like, no, because if you if you give clarity in a uniform kind of a uniform playing field, then you can start making long term plans. I think what is really challenging for industry is to say, I don't know where this is going. So how do I invest in a technology that has a 10 or 20 year payback? If I know, if I don't know, like, and this is, I think, one of the most dangerous things about the pullback on the carbon tax and a lot of the ways that we're doing this, it could derail a lot of the investments that folks made to become more sustainable by really undercutting the kind of economic incentives and alignments that are really right. sort of underpinning it. And it's dangerous because it, it really means that then these, I think in a lot of cases, these very well-meaning companies who want to invest in these things when those incentives aren't aligned, they are going to make the smart business decision, which is ignore Don't it. it. Don't do it. Don't do it. So you need that clarity and that flip-flopping back and forth is going to set us back. And I think I'm, I'm a true believer that mm -hmm. we have a window right now. Most infrastructure investment, it's decades, right? You're talking about decades. So we will get locked in to investment decisions that we make right now. And the reality is all of us, we actually have a huge opportunity in Canada. A lot of infrastructure is coming up to the end of life, right? Um, I've been really distraught with seeing what's been happening in Alberta around some of the pullback. Alberta was one of the leaders in Canada in wind investments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People don't know that. It was like a just, and it, may, and it, it makes sense, right? If you think about the winds coming off the mountains, yeah. huge opportunity. The fact that the government has entrenched itself around the oil sands and said, no, we're not investing in wind anymore. I mean, that's insane. But it's a side, Michael. It comes back to sides. You yeah. dug into polar sides. That's right. That's, that's right. a fundamental problem in this country. Yeah. This is why even the carbon tax, piss poor management, piss poor communication yeah. leads to these decisions because now you pick a side. Yeah. And it's yeah. the unfortunate part. Yep. You know, the only way to fix this, I hate this, you know, I'm going to have friends pissed at me, is a carbon tax. Yeah. Just get rid of that fucking tax word. Yeah. Yeah. Like you've got to word things differently, but you also have to deliver. Yes. You can't promise bullshit. No. And then people look and say, well, where'd the money go? Well, I'm general revenue. Look, I, I, I think all of it, right? It's, but so it's I, also I think tax is a word that you do need to get rid of. But I, I think the other side that, we as consumers right and we as brands actually right yep. like everybody needs to get on board with is yeah the things that we do that are good for the planet for us as a people it costs more than what we have done so like it's a fundamental truth right is everyone goes no no i'm for the environment and then the minute you go listen so we're not greenwashing to be environmentally friendly or to be you know, any of the right words and do the right things for the planet, this is going to cost you 30% more. And all of a sudden they're like, well, you know, yep. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just go down to fast fashion there and grab a t-shirt for $9. Yeah. So you're going, no, no, this is the point, right? Is you can grab a $9 t-shirt, but you almost need to imagine it's going to wind up in a landfill. The other 10,000 you didn't yeah. buy, 
they're in a landfill, right? Yeah. right. So you buy a forty-five dollar T-shirt because we only made a hundred and we sold them all, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. like yeah. the basics of how not to leave yeah. shit lying all over the place. Well, and yeah, maybe right? don't make the returning um, of the clothes so easy online, so that a hundred boxes come to the house and yeah, ninety yeah, yeah, go yeah. back. But, but I think all of that stuff we that. need to learn, right? Like, because I don't think even the consumer that says, "Oh, I want to be green," you're like. No, you actually don't, right? Because yeah. we already know it, right? Is we, we say it, but the minute we touch your wallet, you kind of go, no, no, it's easier to go the other way. So I'm, I'm going to keep going. Yeah, right? and, so, and how do we align? And I think this goes back to breaking down silos. I mean, I think yeah. we make it kind of a loop because the reality is we actually do pay for it. And and I think this is where people yeah. don't realize we pay for it in our healthcare systems, which yeah. are exploding in costs, right? Yeah. So food, this is probably the number one issue here. We're paying for it in our healthcare yeah. systems. We're paying for it in, in various environmental remediation efforts. We're paying for it already. It's just not, the problem is it's not aligned with the, like the, what the consumer pays at, at the, at the, at the cash register is not connected to these other things. And I think this is where we have to tell better stories about this. We have to align those kind of, those loops so that people realize like that the fast fashion thing, I mean, I think is such a great example. Um, it is so it, it somehow fashion went from being, you know, a pretty minuscule part of our overall carbon footprint to massive. And it is be, and people, again, I think this is quintessential. People don't realize how impactful that is. And that, you know, that two, three, $5 shirt that you wear once or twice, and then it just falls apart is so damaging is so yeah. damaging to the environment and to yeah. and to and and you know is, is in literally covered in in um in slave labor in a lot of cases right like is you can't leave it up to the consumer because the consumer will also make the rational choice which is i want the cheapest thing yeah, well, i can't afford it so guess what? Time, i need right? a shirt guys yeah. five dollar shirts where i'm going yeah yeah, yeah. What, and, do, what do you want me to do i can't afford the 30 dollar shirt now yeah. what do you want me to do Yep. And it's, it's a shoulder shirt. Yep. Yep. And this is where I think talking about things like universal basic income, talking about closing the loops around some of these things. I mean, I think these are the kind of things that, again, get too polarized. It's a polarization that kills it again. And and you need to be able to talk yeah. about it. Like for like things yeah. like food, we've food is technically a human right in Canada, right? Access to food should be a human a right on the planet. Everybody should be allowed to eat. Yeah, why aren't we talking about well what the, what would that mean? Well, we are. We got a grocery code of conduct coming. That's going to save us. Yeah. <laughs> We're at the end of the podcast. Don't be opening more doors. We yeah. need like three more hours is what we yeah, really no need. Kidding. Like, well, I can come back on. I can talk. No, we we would love it. Oh my we god, we'd have you back on in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anytime like No, yeah, but I think yeah. stuff like this is important because I I think what happens, I think I think this that you know, we don't dive into, you know, specifically what you're doing in Manitoba and it becomes very philosophical. But mm -hmm. I think this is where people need to reside and people need to understand that you can sit, because not all three of us have the same opinions on everything, mm -hmm. but you can sit and have a discussion. Nobody's yep. leaving the room. Nobody's shooting each other. Like, well, yeah. there's somewhere in the middle this yeah. can work. Yeah. It may not be perfect, but That's it's right. better than what we have right now. That's right. That's right. And just sort of being open, I think, like keeping your mind open and sort of being willing to sort of say, I don't know everything. I, I, I don't I don't know. You know, I don't know all the issues you're facing <clears throat> but to listen to them and to sort of say, OK, how do we then um, take reasonable steps that right. aren't going to have kind of like unintended consequences, but also, frankly, move at a pace that I think most people aren't comfortable with? We are in a climate emergency and i think people forget that like this is not something we if we would have started this when people were talking about this in the late 80s we could have gone slow and steady and really kind of like laid out a bunch of this we are not at that point right i mean i think every year that the ipcc comes out with a new report you look at it and you say wow Last last year's worst case scenario is now our best case scenario, and and that is frightening. People should be afraid. But Michael, we got half the people thinking it's not true. Yeah, it's probably not the right number, but it doesn't matter. Again, you got sides. You've yeah. got a significant segment that, that you got a large amount of people that think this isn't true. This you know what? Exactly you know, and let's 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 assume it's not true. Let's say let's say that we're all mm -hmm. full of shit, 
and mm. it's not as bad. Wouldn't you still want to do something to make sure you don't end up there? I know. Like, it's just, it's like one of those things It's funny too. I, I actually find it funny because like businesses are usually really good at risk management. And I'm like, when, when the risk is so outsized, even if it's tiny, like let's, let's just say it's a 1% chance. Sure. Like, let's say this is really not as critical yeah. as it is, but yeah. Yeah. I know you would think you would try oh. to hedge against that kind what of like, you mean, again, so forget all the bullshit, forget which side you're on. Yeah. Just look at it from that perspective. You want to do nothing? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, I, I mean, at, at the risk of prolonging this just a little bit longer, but I actually really love this discussion. I don't want it to end. <laughs> is, um, I, I, I just, I think it's the enormity of the yeah. situation. Right. Like it's, it's, so it's not, um, you know, like when you've got a stove fire, yeah. you know what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah. Like you, you throw a cover on it, you let the oxygen run out, you're, everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. When your entire kitchen's on fire, you go, shit. Hmm. Yeah. I kind of know what to do, which is to get everyone out of the building and yeah. hope I can get a garden hose on this and call 911, right? Yeah. When your entire house is on fire. You stand from the street and watch. Yeah. You know, you, you can, yeah, right. Like, and so and you, you kind of go. Fire department to come, and you're basically you're, you feel helpless. Like and it's not done, control. right? Like the minute your house catches on fire, the whole house, the thought is it's done. Like I, I don't know how to rescue this, right? right. Yes. And I, I do think that in some senses we've done a little bit of that. Where I actually think more people are wrapped around this idea that we're on fire, except that it's the whole house that's on fire at the moment. Right. Yeah. And so I think there are, there is that of, well, it's just me. So yeah. if I don't go to old Navy and I don't buy one shirt, big deal, the house is still burning down. Right. Like well, now yeah, I need I to go to old Navy. I'm the, I'm the I don't have the any kitchen. t-shirts anymore. It's in the house and it's burning. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Anyway, right? I, I do think there's, um, yeah. the, I think that's the flip side of it. Right. Is, is I think, in the effort of being connected is we almost need to figure out like as business people, entrepreneurs, like how do we create dialogue that matches with the efforts that we're making so that the conversations start to, yeah. you know, again, you to start having dialogue. Phil. I think that's the trick. I don't yeah. think it's much more than yeah, just yeah, having yeah, dialogue. Yeah, I, I think people need to learn to talk again yeah. and yeah. not be right or wrong. Like yeah. just listen. Yeah. Cause sometimes again, somewhere in the middle is probably the answer. It is not on the fringes. Typically, we got to yeah. get off this thing of, of sides. Yeah. We um we are out of time. Um, so we need Michael. I, I want to ask you some stuff. Talk about Manitoba. Yeah, yeah. We 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 talked a little bit, but um, so we do want to bring you back on. Um, we could do it fairly quickly because I think one, we we want to get this episode out so we can get cultivate out right yes. because it's December. So if people yeah. don't know about it and they want to think about going, they should probably be doing that pretty quick now um so we'll do some of that if people want to find you where do they find you michael yeah so check out our website um food and beverage manitoba.ca uh the contact is into there um you can uh, you can share my email address as well if people want to if, if people want to we'll share your linkedin maybe that's a yeah we'll do that we'll share your linkedin we, we cool. tend not to try to share emails yep yeah. No, fair uh, enough. Share my yeah. LinkedIn. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to connect with folks. Um, you know, I think Cultivate's a great opportunity. Um, we already have people, you know, who are coming in from across the country. I think we're trying to provide something that's a little unique. Uh, that is not, um, that is not, you know, obviously there's a Manitoba focus, but I think the issues that we're dealing with and the folks that we're bringing in are not Manitoba specific, right? right. Like these are issues mm -hmm. that are sort of the whole industry is dealing with. And so I think there's a real great opportunity to learn from each other uh, to and, and really to start creating a community and going back to what you were saying, Kenny, which is building bridges. Is, is, is to find those ways of, of saying, hey, what is my role as a small entrepreneur in this right. bit? You know, because I think I think your metaphor of the house on fire, Phil, is is bang on. I think a lot of people have just kind of thrown their hands up and said, I can't do anything about this. Yeah. But the reality is that every set like to, to build on that metaphor it does matter each decision each second each each like there, there's a big difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and two and 2.5 and three so it, it how much of the how much of the house is going to be left standing what survives 
makes a huge difference. So yeah. the way we react, and and again, I think we've been kind of conditioned to, to feel like individual responsibility on both sides. Individual responsibility was either everything, so it was all on the consumer, and then I think we've swinged back and sort of saying now, it can't be because it's impossible at this point. It has to be on that systems level and policy. And I think the answer is somewhere in between. It, it's not either or. It's like we yeah. have to, it's still useful to throw your your fire hose onto the onto the it house. It won't hurt. It won't hurt. It's still gonna it, it, maybe you'll buy some time before the exactly. fire fire department gets there and can put out the fire. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe, you know, maybe you know the the outbuilding is gonna survive and some of the yeah. other things, right? And like it, it matters. It matters. It maybe your neighbor will come with their hose. Because imagine right. what happens if we get back to sort of that, yeah, you know, working together to try to stop the house from burning down, Phil. That's right. Like typically there's yeah. four sides to the neighborhood. Yeah. So everybody up with a hose. Yeah. That's right. That up. Yeah. And I, and I think that like resisting that temptation to kind of like say, there's nothing I can do is yeah. so crucial. There is something that everybody can do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's, and, and I think business has a role there's already incredible and part of it is celebrating our conference is about celebrating the incredible work that companies are already doing uh one of our title sponsors is maple leaf right they are the largest carbon neutral food company in the world and they haven't stopped at that they are going now and bringing everything in-house they're doing biodigesters investing in regenerative agriculture like this is incredible the work that's being done by leaders into the, it uh, in this and so we're there to celebrate what companies are doing but also challenge them to push even further and faster yeah i love it i love 